教导我们如何了生脱死，离苦得乐，速成无生。为了三嘎，为 great virtue， out of compassion。For the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to live suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize numbers. Namu Tassa. Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahodi Samyo Samputoshi Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahodi Samyo Samputoshi Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Sao Yu Wu Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even through billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gowei Shishong, Tajia Amitofo, Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, February the 13th. And it's Saturday night, February the 12th, back in California, we're going to be looking at the Flower Garland Sutra, the 10 stages chapter, the Shi Di Pin. We're looking at the verses of the, the repetitive verses of the text that tell us what a Bodhisattva is like. And uh, boy, uh, encountering this chapter completely turned around my understanding of what Buddhism was about. And how to cultivate it, how to approach it. Um, today's set of verses that we're going to look into are just perfect. For These are the, the perfect summary of what my new understanding of Buddhism is about and how somebody should approach it if they are going to uh, make, uh, put a spiritual component into their lives. So if you want to know uh, what do I get out of Buddhism and how do I approach it, today's lesson, today's lecture is the one for you. Okay, let's begin. Let's start. We've had our Dharma request and I very much appreciate the work, uh, the time and the effort of our volunteers who not only put this uh, lecture on the air in a variety of formats, but also do things like translate, translate it into, into Putonghua, into Mandarin, and also into Vietnamese, so that the words that I say can go further out into, into the world. So I really do appreciate that. And uh, I'm humbled by people's devotion to the Dharma. And it makes me want to be more sincere, do a better job, to focus in and, and get it right so that I can uh, do my part in this work of, they say, Hong Fa Li Shang, they say, teaching the Dharma and benefiting living beings. So, okay, let's invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the 10 directions and the three periods of time, the Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the Dharma Protectors. They say the Tian Bong Abu, the gods and the dragons and the eightfold pantheon of spiritual dharma protectors to draw near. We lit the incense, we washed our face, we're ready to go. Here we go. Oh, who's up? 
And we have one more piece of protocol in our ritual that we do. And that's to say that we want to acknowledge country. Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language group practice their spiritual connections to land and to all creation here in Queensland, this location for thousands of years before it was Queensland, when it was their land. Today, we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians. It's still their land. With gratitude that we share this land today with sorrow for the costs of that sharing and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging. So by doing that, by acknowledging country, we bring added presence to our lecture today. We enrich the audience. We bring the light in of the earliest human presence here in the land. And it makes it, it plants the roots of our lecture deeper. Um, when I'm back in California, I will be doing the very same thing, only uh, we'll be acknowledging country from the Ohlone people and the Pomo people who were the traditional custodians of the land where the uh, uh, gringos have only been for a short time, comparatively speaking. And uh, we leave a trail of destruction wherever we go. <laughs> That's what we do. We lay waste to all other. Our species just decimates every other species. Down uh, near the bay in Berkeley, if you go down University Avenue towards the bay, you reach a place in Emeryville. It's called Shell Mound Road. And uh, that's just the one place that is named. In fact, all along the bay, near what is now called the Berkeley Marina in that area, uh, were shell mounds. What were shell mounds? They were mounds of shells because life in the San Francisco Bay area, particularly in the East Bay, where you had the ocean, the peninsula, the bay, and then where you were living, they had all that buffer for storms coming in. Life was good. You go down to the bay and harvest some shellfish and thrive. There was plenty to eat so much that the clams and the oysters and the mussels and the whelks and all, they just mounded up in piles, shell mounds. So all the folks who were there before us uh, left their traces, but they uh, had a way of leaving a lighter footprint on the land. So that's a lot that we can learn from traditional wisdom. Indeed. Here's today's text. Last week, we heard about the fears and the fearlesses, the fears and the courage that, uh, that cures those fears, that banishes those fears. We're going to continue today. And let me say again, what are we doing? Tell you again. This is the, uh, the first out of 10 stages, excuse me, and if this were a Chinese monk, I would have to do it this way. Okay, a monk in China. The 10 stages are 10 grades for a bodhisattva's education. This, the Avatamsaka Sutra is the text that, let me do this here. There we go. The Avatamsaka Sutra is the text that talks about the bodhisattva, how to become one yourself how to turn an ordinary person into a bodhisattva. And you do that with these practices and uh, education. It's a, it's a curriculum. It's a learning that you do step by step by step. When you're at the 10th stage, you are really close to being a Buddha. There's only two more stages before, two more steps before you have removed all of the ignorance that previously covered you over. <laughs> inside. And as we've said before, um, in the Bodhisattva path, you make progress by subtraction. You get rid of things. You don't get anything. The higher you go in the Bodhisattva path, you remove ignorance, you remove confusion, you remove attachment, you remove defilement, you remove affliction, troubles, blues from your nature. All those shadows are gone. And then when that nature shines out, oh, that's Buddhahood. 
you have you and the Tao, the inner truth of things before language, before we think, before language and thought, it's present. So we progress by subtraction. And all these stages are descriptions of what's what it what happens when you uncover your nature. That's so interesting, just, just that fact in itself that. Um, people, it's in the marketplace world where we spend most of our time and the world where things are bought and sold. Uh, the idea that you don't get anything makes you what? You're a loser. You don't know how to bargain. You're a bad business person, right? Because you didn't get anything. So the marketplace, and as they say, the way place are... 180 degrees apart. You, you can cultivate the way place in the marketplace, but you, uh, you have to, your mind has to be fully on the inner nature to, to uncover it. And you, these practices, these 10 stages are uh, degrees of accomplishment of how much the Bodhisattva got rid of, how much of that ignorance he uh, how much he's shown on and destroyed with the light of his nature, transformed with the light of his nature. You know how it goes. If you are out mm, in a cave, let's say you're, you're climbing in the mountains and you discover a cave. If you go into that cave and the darkness in there has never seen the sunlight ever, as long as the cave has been there. And if you take a light, a torch, you take your hand torch and you go, boom, you turn the light on and that light blasts apart the darkness. That light can have been there for since the planet was formed, but a single flashlight, the light from a single flashlight beam will break apart. Darkness has been there for hundreds of thousands of years. So it's not to be feared that we won't reach success, it's only to be feared that we won't take that first step. Once on the path, if you keep cultivating, that light will break apart the darkness. And it, it happens through removal. So we're in the stage now. First stage, Bodhisattva, stage of happiness. What is he about? He's happy, she is happy, because she, he, makes vows, sees ahead, where they want to go, their life has meaning. In a time of pandemic, oh my goodness, uh, we have, uh, people are in a state of languishing, they say. You just don't really want to get up much because you can't go far, you're quarantined. You go outside, there's a fatal illness outside the door. Why bother? What, uh, who's, you know, who's noticing? Everybody is just trying to stay healthy and not get sick. That kind of world, you know? So in a world like that, it's nice to have the Dharma because what we're going to discover today in the, the text is that the things that were important and true when the Buddha first spoke the sutra are still important and still true. 2,500 years hasn't changed our, our view, our vision, our perspective on the fundamental truths of the Buddha's wisdom. See if you agree. I mean, don't take it from me, listen and see what you think. Um, so the Bodhisattva in this first stage is happy because why he or she is learning how to give. They are benefactors and because they are big hearted as they give, in all different ways, from charity to making offerings. Um, all the ways they give, they take the merit, the goodness that comes, the good feeling and the connection, and they give it a second time by transference. They dedicate it, the invisible but real uh, blessings that come from making others happy, and they share those. So that's the Dharma at work using this double-barreled form of generosity 
in order to um, make their heart happy with emotion and to make their dharma body happy with blessings. So, and then they're connected once they give to others invisibly. That's the neat thing about this dedication of merit. I say one more thing, then we'll jump into the text. The, um, the neat thing about this giving of dharma, fa bu shi, fa shi, they call it, three kinds of giving, wealth or material, courage, and then dharma. They say giving dharma is the highest kind of giving. What this does is it ties into the first step before this first stage, which is what the Bodhi resolve, the Putishin. Our Bodhisattva has made the Bodhi resolve, which is he or she has determined that they have a future in developing and uncovering their own wisdom. And that wisdom is the same as the Buddhas. They know they can. They can have wisdom. Wisdom is their part. That's their future. That's their their real Ming Yun. We talked about luck last week around Buddha, around the New Year's, and this Bodhisattva's Ming, their their future Ming, their future, their their destiny. If you have such a thing in Buddhism, is what that they're going to have great wisdom. And that's the first half. The second half is they know how to get there. Is they uncover it from within. So get to work pulling the covers off whatever is covering what's within. And what are those coverings? They say living beings and afflictions. So they have to do zhongsheng. They have to take living beings across to uncover them off their nature so that wisdom can arise. And in so doing, great compassion arises. So, okay, got that part? That's one principle. How does giving and dedication of merit work, giving of Dharma? So if you're going to become a Buddha with the Bodhi resolve, you have to have living beings to take across. Then you have to have those living beings pay attention to you. You have to get on their good side. You have to make them like you. Through how? Through giving, through speaking nicely, through cooperating with them, through service, and mostly through giving. And so... What do they give living beings? The merit that they dedicate. So in this first stage, we're gonna find out these bodhisattvas are so happy, the stage of happiness, because they're learning how to give. And now finally, they know how to become a Buddha because they're going to be giving the merit that they cultivate to living beings through transference, hui xiang, hui xiang gong de. They, guarantee, they dedicate that merit. And those living beings invisibly get it, that, that merit, because they've been sending it out like a, lamp, a lighthouse sends out light. And they go, oh, I have a good feeling about this person. Seems like I'm connected to them. Some, they're kind of nice. I like them. Invisibly, these people have been receiving the merit that you've been dedicating. So that's, that's the deal. That's how it works. Okay, shall we share my screen here? And here we go. Okay, today's text says, we'll, we're gonna go down, let's see, we're gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six, six before we get to vows. Okay, next week will be vows. Here we go. Chang Xing Da Tsu Min Hung Yo Xin Gong Jing Tsan Kui Gong De Bei Er Ye Sung Shan Fa Always practicing great kindness and empathy, ever faithful they show deep respect. The virtues of shame and remorse touch their hearts day and night their wholesome dharmas increase. Good again. Yao fa chen shi li, bu ai shou zhu yu, si wei so wen fa, yan li qu zhao heng. 
They delight in the Dharma's actual benefits. They do not enjoy pursuing desires. They reflect upon the Dharma they hear and leave behind the habits of craving and grasping. Now, do it again. Bhutan Uliyang Weiyao Fo Puti Yi Xin Chou Fo Zhi Zhuan Jing Wu Yi Nian They are never greedy for benefits or offerings. They only enjoy the Buddha's Bodhi. With one mind, they seek the Buddha's knowledge. Their concentration focused with no other thoughts. Right? Should we stop there for now? We did three. Okay. Set that aside. Pick this up. Take a look here. We're going to boost that up. There, look it, always practicing deep kindness and empathy, ever faithfully show deep respect. The virtues of shame and remorse touch their hearts. Day and night, their wholesome dharmas increase. Look it, I put in red the um, virtues, the operative qualities of this text. For example, Kindness and empathy, faithful, deep respect, shame and remorse, wholesome dharmas, delighting in the dharmas, benefits. That should be red. Let's make that red. Font, show font colors. There we go. Do not pursue desire. Reflect upon the dharma. Leave behind habits of craving and grasping. Never greedy. Enjoy the Buddha's bodhi. Seek knowledge. Concentration focused. Okay, those are three. We did the three. So look at this. What's the point here? The point is, this is the real Buddha dharma. For the Mahayana. For our tradition. For the Han Chuan Fu Jiao. Not what I thought. What I thought when I first heard Buddhism, I heard it, look at the historical record. In America, North America, where I grew up, I'm now in Australia, but I'll, we'll just say in terms of learning the Dharma, we're the same. Europe is the same. The, in, let's use North America as the lens, right? The very first official Buddhist establishment uh, in the Bay Area, certainly, was the Japanese Buddhist church. It was the Jodo Shinshu, the Japanese Pure Land School, and it came over from Japan and bought and established its first church in 1893. Uh, 1898, 1893. Professor Nakasone will correct me. So, that was the first one. And the Jodo Shinshu in, its, in the West Coast and then East Coast and around the country established similar churches. They would often buy church buildings or shop fronts and they used protective coloring. They tried to make it as much like a Lutheran church as possible. Hymnals, sermons, uh, passing the plate, uh, Boy Scouts, you know, they did a really good job of, of accommodating Western culture while still practicing Nembutsu. Nam momidab, nam momidab, nam momidab. That was the first one. After them, who came next? Well, honestly, it was the Beatniks. It was Gary Snyder, Philip Whalen, and uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg in part, and Jack Kerouac in part, more from a literary side, who learned Japanese Zen. And were moved. Gary Snyder studied at UC Berkeley, studied languages so he could read the Heart Sutra, read the Lotus Sutra. And they incorporated ideas uh, from Zen, 
Japanese Zen in their poetry, in their writing. Kerouac wrote the Dharma Bums. I read it and was discovered Buddhism existed in the world. I was a teenager. So that was the next. Why didn't we learn about Han Chuan Fo Jiao, the Bodhisattva path until now? 1949, the bamboo curtain came down and some Buddhists and Buddhist lay people and some monks traveled from China to Taiwan and Hong Kong. But, uh, and Master Hua was one of those, uh, but for the most part, the, the Buddhist, the people who could, you know, uh, transplant the culture in the West had to stay behind. They weren't able to get out of China after 1949. Then uh, Vietnamese monks uh, and laity 19, from 1975 came out bit by bit. Uh, and we learned about Vietnamese Mahayana and the, the Chinese with its Chinese roots. So it wasn't until 1962 when Master Xuan Hua arrived in San Francisco that the entirety, the, the full complete tradition of Han Chuan Fu Jiao, of the Chinese Mahayana, uh, planted down its roots in America. And then in 1969, the first five Americans traveled to Asia, got ordained in the Mahayana tradition and became uh, the first orthodox proper traditional Sangha, uh, took on a Western face. So that's why we didn't know we didn't know about it. What we knew was Zen. And Zen was going to get Kensho, going to get Satori, going to have somebody standing behind me with a stick and whack me. And I'm going to get a koan and, and, and just try to figure out what the koan means. And if I get it right, I get rewarded with Satori, Kensho. You know, what we read, we read books and we practiced Zazen. And we, what did we do? We ate brown rice and vegetables, <laughs> Zen macrobiotic cooking. Any piece of the culture that we could find, we, we took. So that was how we started. And it was something, it wasn't nothing. It wasn't the tradition. It wasn't the Buddhism that roots back to Shakyamuni Buddha or to the sutras. Um, Zazen was terrific, Dogen Zenji is terrific. And uh, there were different aspects of Zen, that different seeds that planted themselves around the world. But when, so I arrived at Gold Mountain Monastery seeking enlightenment, and I'd already been practicing Zazen in Kyoto. And when I got to Gold Mountain Monastery, I heard always practicing great kindness and empathy, ever faithful, they show deep respect, the virtues of shame and remorse touch their hearts. Day and night, their wholesome dharmas increase. It's like, that sounds kind of goody goody. Is that, I, is that enough macho? I understand Zen is pretty tough, you know? They delight in the dharma's actual benefits. They don't enjoy pursuing desires. They reflect upon the dharma they hear and leave behind the habits of craving and grasping. It's like, ah, uh, that's a lot, isn't it? Uh, sounds like, are you sh I don't know, I'm not really comfortable look, hearing all this not greedy, uh, craving, not grasping, uh, just seeking. It's like, sounds a lot like kind of school for, you know, conduct. You get the conduct medal, uh, sort of, you know, you get virtue studies. This, those words were not in my vocabulary. And then when I discovered that Master Hua was a filial son, oh my goodness, I had to really reflect because filiality, paying attention to the roots of life that are your parents was not in my vocabulary. Uh, as a Westerner, we got the car keys at age 16. Mom, dad, I'm out of here. Vroom. Family station wagon, hit the road. Yeah, 
So what am I saying? I'm saying this is the real teachings of the Buddha from the Avatamsaka Sutra. There are other flavors of Buddhism, but look what it focuses on. It focuses on character. Kinda. Nida Renping. Gu Xing. Dao The virtue of your cage, your, your nature. Who are you as a person? That's the question. This is high level Dharma. This is the 10 stages chapter. This Bodhisattva is not far from success as a Buddha. There's a lot of, there's a road to walk, but he's on the path. He's enrolled. He's in the program. <laughs> he's, you know, a freshman and a few more years and a freshman graduate and they, they start doing their own teaching. So, okay, get it, right? What a big surprise for me to discover what I didn't understand about the Dharma. And here it is on the page. Look at these, these things in red. That's all called virtue. That's all called virtue. Let's, let's go back. First of all, what I want to do is uh, take just a minute here, unshare. I, I know people have to listen to my voice, and that's a lot for so long, you know, listening 90 minutes. When I started chanting Guan Yun, it started to rain here in Queensland. Guan Yun Bodhisattva. Back to the text. Oh my goodness. It's sort of nice to hear the rain on a tin roof, isn't it? Here we go. Okay, ready? Let's see. What is, what is the Avatamsaka Sutra, really the words of the Buddha, in English, say to us about the Bodhisattva? What are they like? What's a Bodhisattva like? Shou Xing Po Lo Mi Ren Li Chang Xu Kuang Ru Shuo Ar Xiu Xing An Zhu Shi Yu Zhong. They cultivate all the paramitas. They stay away from flattery and deceit. They can cultivate according to the teachings. They rest in true and actual speech. Wu Zhu Fu Jia Wu Shi Wu Sa Jie Wu Yao Yi Shi Shi Chang Li Yi Shi Jian. They do not defile the Buddha's household, nor do they abandon the Bodhisattva's precepts, taking no delight in worldly matters. Constantly, they benefit the world. Xiu Shan Wu Yan Zu, 
转秋生生道，如是好要法，功德一相应。They cultivate the good without fatigue. They seek the path that grows gradually more sublime. Their love for the Dharma grows as well as merit and virtue respond with principles. Yep, that's what it says. They cultivate all the paramitas. So we're continuing. I, I put in red the virtues, the qualities of character in this these six verses. Six verses all about who the bodhisattva is inside. Who and if I respond, if this is a virtue proposition today in our university board meeting, I learned what is a virtue proposition. So that's where your virtues actually correspond to people's needs, where they become relevant. Having the virtues is good, but how they're expressed and connect is uh, how they you put them into into work, put them into the world. So look at they cultivate paramitas. They don't flatter. They don't deceive. They cultivate according to the teachings. They rest in true and actual speech. Those four lines I should probably print on my forehead. That's the story of my life and cultivation: true and actual speech. They don't defile the Buddha's household. They're true to their their compass heading from start to finish. They don't deviate. They don't go in the back door of the Buddha's household. Nor do they abandon the Bodhisattva's precepts. It's a myth. It's a mistake to think that once you become a Bodhisattva, you don't have to worry about things like the rules anymore. Somehow you transcended rules. That's a mistake. Bodhisattvas get better and better at their cultivation, not laxer and laxer. They don't care about worldly matters. They only care to do things that help help others. Okay, summing it up, they cultivate good. That could be a capital G without fatigue. They seek the path that gets more and more sublime, more and more. Um, Give me another synonym for sublime. Excellent. They just they get better, right? They get path grows better, finer, more refined. Yeah, but just if it was sunlight, it's brighter sunlight. Their love for the Dharma grows as well. And check this out: merit and virtue responds with principles. Gongda, yi, xiangying. They say. I thought about this. What is how does merit and virtue respond with principles? Here's here's what makes sense to me. So merit and virtue is the result of the cultivation that they're doing. They're uncovering their nature, and the the principles. It's e. In Chinese, like I Chi, and the the principles are already there. That's kind of the the hard wiring of their nature that they discover when they uncover it. So when you cultivate, you have a result. There's merit and virtue. There's goodness done in the world. The vibrations, the ripples that go out from good deeds that you do. Just say you know you throw a party, you throw a birthday party for a child. This the goodness that the child, the kids who come to the party are vibrating with the with the fun of what they're expecting, the food they're going to eat, the friends they're going to see, the, the the games they're going to play, the laughter they're going to have. As kids, you know, they can't they can't sleep the night before and they can't get to sleep the night after because it's so much fun. It's just so ripples that we do from goodness go out like that, and they touch people. That force that you release in the world from cultivation—that's gunda. It's it's a the only force that cuts without harming. You see, that corresponds shangying with your nature, which is 
kind of like wiring or software you could think that's in the nature waiting to be activated. It's a circuitry waiting to be set into motion. So the, the gongda that you do activates your nature. Another good example would be, um, it's long been a, an understanding of Chinese culture that education for children, um, as I mentioned, we had a university board meeting today, it took hours. The fun part about those board meetings is I get to spend time with educators, people who love the process of teaching, people who love that the light that happens when we learn something, when we study and make a connection. That's, those are people I like to be with. There's a joy of discovery and, and it's just wholesomeness. This is a, a good thing for people to do is to teach each other things. And it's not only the teachers give it to the students. Dharmaram Buddhist University is centered on conversation, it's centered on exchange. It's dialogue, it's conversation. It's not through uh, one, one way imparting, spitting out knowledge that you absorb. No, it's like, let's read it and talk about what we've learned. And if you read, when you have a classic, when you have a, a truly great book, um, every reading sends more light. Every, every reading deepens your understanding, of it, like sutras, for example, right? Sutras are a wonderful book we get to talk about. So uh, anyway, so my point was that um, the, uh, this bodhisattva is here uh, learning and he's uh, the virtues the, the, the force of the gongda that he creates activates the principles in the nature. I, I was saying that Chinese culture has this idea that what you, they call, when you teach a child at the very beginning, you qi meng, right? You activate their potential. You kind of moisten their sprouts. Sprouts before they be, sprout are what? Seeds. But if you moisten them and then cover them and let them mature, pull the, the wet towel off and here are all these little green shoots coming out of the seeds. And if you continue it, you've got bean sprouts uh, or whatever you're sprouting, alfalfa sprouts or whatever it is. And that's how you teach children is you activate their, you nurture, nourish their sprouts, their potentials with the water of kindness and the water of curiosity and exploration and the fun of learning, the thrill of learning. And you have a kid who is gonna learn their whole life, lifelong learning. That was really how Master Shenhua uh, taught us the Dharma and how I saw him live his life, was he had a, a, a curiosity about anything, about the way tables were built and how the joints worked together. And, he had a curiosity about how people were built and what motivated us. And, and uh, so here the Bodhisattva, Gong De Yi, Xiang Ying, the merit and the Yi, the principles that are already innate, Xiang Ying, start to interact. That's what I think that means. I don't know if, if people agree. Um, he is definitely, she is definitely a student here. So they cultivate the good without fatigue, doing all this good, all these red, all the red here that I've outlined is the, the virtues of the description of the second stage, the, I'm sorry, first stage is bodhisattva, right? And they seek the path that grows more sublime. Their love for the Dharma grows as well as they feel their nature start to unfold as the cultivation that they do plugs in to the software inherent in their nature, the, the programs that are now kicked into to being, such as what? Such as eloquence, the ability to speak, such as samadhi, the ability to be really still, such as kindness and compassion, seeing the connections between all of us and all beings, such as Dharani, the incredible 
quality of uh, being able to communicate in a variety of levels with a variety of beings from a single thought. Holoni, right? Power of mantras. So all these different, right? Look at all this. Kindness, empathy, faith, respect, shame and remorse, wholesome dharmas, delight in the dharma's benefits. Not pursuing desire anymore the way we used to. Reflecting on the dharma. Leaving craving and grasping behind. Leaving greed behind. Only enjoying bodhi, this quest for wisdom and compassion. Seeking knowledge. Focusing concentration. Cultivating the paramitas, these tools for crossing over. Staying away from flattery and deceit. Cultivating according to the teachings, resting in actual speech. Not defiling the Buddha's household, not abandoning bodhisattva's precepts, no delight in worldly matters, constantly benefiting the world, cultivating good in all these ways above, seeking the path that grows more sublime with a love for the Dharma that grows. Merit and virtue responds with principles. How cool is that? Now, something came to my mind as I was enjoying this passage. And it was this line from the Da Xiao. The Da Xue, as people would say, Master Hua would say Da Xiao. Let's, uh, no, 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 no. We want Li Shu. Let's see here. Where was that? Was it Feng Song? It wasn't Feng Song. There it is. Li Shu. There we go. What is this? It says, the path to the greatest of lessons lies in lighting up, illuminating I, I, ah, L, L, illuminating one's inherent virtue in drawing near, I'm gonna say getting close, in staying close to the people and resting in the highest goodness. Here we go. Now, that is a line attributed to Confucius, the path to the greatest of lessons. How do we get to the greatest of lessons, the greatest learning, Da Xiao? The big, big learning, the path to the biggest learning lies in three things. Here's one, Ming Ming De, lighting up, making bright your inherent, your il illuminating one's bright virtue. In getting close to people and staying there, not losing your roots, staying close to where people really are, right? No ivory tower in this greatest learning. And then this one, Chiryu Chirshan. What is the Chirshan? What is the highest goodness? Probably locating your own mind and learning to stand on your own roots. And for the Mahayana, we would say it is the... Uh, it, it, it's the Bodhi resolve, right? That's the highest goodness. So this is what life is about. What are we supposed to be doing here? This. Do we feel alienated? Do we feel like these last two years have just been too much? And the sooner maybe, you know, to give up, there's a great, great rise in the suicides these days. Just, just quit. Not when we listen to Confucius. Say, what is life about? He says, yes, if you want to learn something, yeah, it's by learning, lifelong learning. Let's, let's learn something. The greatest lesson to learn is in pulling the covers off your nature, getting rid of your own ignorance, in finding the right direction, 180 degrees, 180 degrees, turn around. Then Finding your people, getting with your community, 
of like-minded folks, whoever they are, everybody's different, different families. And then together deciding what you're about. The highest goodness is a goal for your life. What is that? And from the Buddhist point of view, we would say getting wise and finding your connection with all living beings. There you go. <laughs> Time for another music break. Break out the banjo. Mm. All right. Um, any, are there any questions on YouTube, Jerry? If so, send them my way. Um, I, I was motivated to, uh, um, again, that this, our meeting that we had this morning, um, our master Hung Chu at the end of the meeting said, how's everybody doing? There were 23 people in the meeting gathered on Zoom from all over the world. And that was a good question. You know, is everybody doing okay? And in the world right now, there is tremendous tension about uh, the potential of a war to break out. And the, on the other side, the side that is amassing troops on the border of a sovereign nation and is doing everything that looks like, like they're getting ready to go to war, that side is blaming America. It's America's fault. Okay. Doesn't matter who <laughs> that kind of propaganda, that fake news is a new thing. Uh, the, the point is war is a mistake. There's never been a good war starting. And yet how funny, how funny that worldwide, there's this phenomenon where people, warlike people always feel that God is on their side. The idea of a holy war. God is on my side. God is going to help us because he's really for us. He wants us to win. He, right? God, the male, the masculine figure, the authority figure. And the funny part is the other side over there, with their weapons, they feel that God's on their side. Whose side is God on? Can God be on both sides? So as our Nobel laureate, poet, and shaman Bob Dylan says, if God's on our side, he'll stop the next war. He says, if God is kind, and if God loves us, he won't let us destroy ourselves and innocent people in flaming exploding metal piercing our bodies and destroying us and our lives and our countries that won't happen so let's hope let's hope god is just and kind and loving uh meanwhile we can't wait uh trust in god but attend to your camel right um there is uh it's the people who goes who go to war thinking that somehow using God as an excuse, right? Anyway, so that's the kind of tense, tense time we're in. Plus, COVID, uh, the, the Omicron variant is on the wane. But what if four months down the road, a new one, a new variant, we have to gear back up? Well, for one thing, at that time, we will have some pills that have, that are now, because of miracles in medical science, are being developed that will work with the variants that have already come down the pike. So, yeah, it's scary to think that breathing the air can kill you. That was the fear with AIDS, was when if AIDS became heterosexual uh, transmitted, then reproducing the species was fatal. 
that's not a successful strategy situation for any species when what was normally there to help you uh, help you continue in life and reproduce and have another generation um, is fatal, can kill you. That's, there's trouble there, that's a problem. So uh, we've now created so much uh, turbid, dirty world, polluted world that we have viruses in the air that unprotected without a mask will kill you, for sure it will. So yeah, um, time for us to, to uh, uh, find a way to make it through without doing further harm to ourselves. And so when the Dharma master said, how are we all doing? What are we doing to, uh, to get through without breaking, without letting the stress uh, have us turn on our family members in anger or turn on our coworkers or turn on people on Twitter and just vent because we can't control it. Uh, did everybody see where koalas are now endangered in two states in Australia? New South Wales and Queensland, koalas are now endangered. They think there are 80 some thousand uh, koalas left in the wild. And that's, that's a trend, that's a downward trend, but that is uh, very scary. Um, here in our patch of green, our patch of bush here, we've heard a koala pass through. They make loud noises when they're looking for females, males do that. But we haven't, they're hard to see because they're up in the trees. And if, you, if you're not walking like this, you don't see them. They're, they're mostly sleeping. So you have to be really sharp eyed, but we haven't seen koalas in our patch of uh, 20 miles down the road. There are uh, koalas, wild koalas, but they're last year in New South Wales, the population of koalas decreased by 40% just last year. So big trouble. And the government has declared them uh, endangered now. So this is a time of decline, great, the great uh, change in all living things moving on, great extinction, they say. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, I was thinking about these qualities and uh, what it was like, who, who do I know who embodied those, you know, that goodness, that when it comes to Buddhism, it's talking about who we are inside matters the most, not what kind of robe you wear, how you hold your mouth, what kind of language you talk, you talk Zen language. I remember posturing to be a Zen guy you know, coming back from Japan. Uh, as soon as I arrived from my senior year in college, having been to Japan for my junior year, uh, they, my professor invited me to speak about my experience in Zen. And so I had, I had a haircut not different from this, pretty much the same, wearing a black turtleneck and sitting in full lotus everywhere and holding my mouth like a Zen guy. <laughs> what a joke. And having no idea, you know, that it was what makes, what makes a real Buddhist is the inner qualities. And let me say this, this is something that having been around the Buddhist world now, not everybody talks this way. What I just showed you, uh, let me pop it up from here again. Um, what I just showed you is from Confucius, right? This is from the Dodge, from the four books. And some people would say, but that's not Buddhism. That's Confucianism. Well, take a look here. What about the Tao? Is the Tao Buddhist or Confucian or Taoist? Well, the answer is all of the above. Correct. When we get to the Chinese Mahayana, when we get to the Abhatamsaka Sutra, the Sharangama Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, these are the qualities 
that emerge in the teachings. You look to your character, not to psychic power, not to poetry or being fat or any, what, what, are the, what do you think about, you know, the fat Buddha, Maitreya, Buddha, fat, right? Ah, 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 me, ah, ah. What's your idea of a Buddhist? Well, in Hong Kong, I was told early on that in Hong Kong, people, that Buddhism has not always been really popular in Hong Kong. And there were years when monks were considered so aggressively uh, greedy for offerings that when people saw a monk coming down the walk, they would go Amidovo and cross the street to avoid them. <laughs> so Amidovo means please protect me, stay away, you know. So monks were not always seen as possessors of kindness and empathy and faith and respect and shame and remorse and wholesome garments. This is the Mahayana. And I really like this version of Buddhism. When you go to other Buddhist nations in the world, they don't talk this way as much. In the Mahayana, it's overt that we get to Buddhahood. Buddhahood is attainable. You get there by uncovering these wholesome qualities in your nature. That's what it's about. Once these qualities are, they're all of the, the one, the, when you are one, the obey, when all 10,000 qualities are replete, you are a Buddha. So virtue leads to enlightenment, to wisdom, to the Tao. That's real interesting, right? I didn't know that before. I was just showing this. I forgot to share my screen. Here we go. These are the qualities. This is how you get to Buddhism. And Confucius, being a teacher who talked about these things. Okay, there we go. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, Confucius also talked about character. That virtue was his lesson and virtues are innate and they haven't changed. They're the same now in 2022 as they were back in 222 BC, right? Before the common era, BCE. So this is, this is the path. I like this version of Buddhism. It's not in mantras. I mean, it develops in mantras. There are mantras to be recited. But the cultivation of the Bodhisattva path, which is particularly what Master Hua uh, left for us to explore, to walk, he points to who we are inside. And these are people I like to hang with. They're not greedy. They enjoy waking up. They seek knowledge. They stay away from deceit and flattery. They don't forget their precepts. They're not interested in fame and power. They want to benefit us, cultivate good. Those are people I enjoy. That's who I would like to become. So anyway, just to say, these are the qualities that I find in the Chinese Mahayana, this blend of virtue studies, Tao De, and Sibei, compassion, and Shihui, and wisdom. Mm. Uh, oh, uh, one more thing. That another idea that I had was somebody says, what does your religion teach? This blend, these, these qualities that the Bodhisattva is working on, this is sutra text, right? This is the teachings. This is what what the Buddha taught at the very beginning in the Avatamsaka. This is not for kids. This requires a kind of maturity to bring out 
these, this results from choices that we make in relationship with the world. Okay. To not be greedy, to leave craving behind, to stay away from flattery and deceit, to not defile the Buddha's household, to not abandon your precepts, to not delight them. Those are adult decisions that we make when choices arise and we choose towards virtue, towards harmlessness, towards goodness. That's what I like, right? Kids or people who only want to let go and let God, perfectly fine. This is not passive, waiting for some supreme being to act through me. These are choices that I, as a functioning adult, make for goodness and virtue. This is how we, a virtue proposition, right? We actually progress through a curriculum of learning to become better. All right, got it. Pick up the banjo and sing again. Who is this person? I want people to know who this is. Anybody recognize this individual? The banner behind him says Shaolin Miao Yi, the Miao Zhi, huh? Miao Zhi. The wonderful skill of Shaolin. And he's holding a martial arts sword. This is the late Chan Master Hai Deng, who, by the way, was also a lineage holder in the uh, Wei Yang Zong, along with Master Hua, the same school as Master Hua. Here he is again as an older monk. This Master Hai Deng, sea lamp, ocean lamp. That's what Hai Deng means. There he is. That steady gaze. Tough guy. Um, take a look here. This is very interesting. Okay, the one here to your right is Master Haidang as a young monk. Who's that in the middle? The elder with the white beard, Master Empty Cloud. Xu Lao, Xu Yan Lao, Master Empty Cloud. So here is Master Haidang serving as an attendant to Master Xu Yun. Uh, what does it say here? There's a caption here. Oh, going the wrong way. Okay, the caption says, Xu Gong Yun Lao Ren Bai Shi Ba Ling Tong Fa Tu Fa Sun He Ying. This is Master Empty Cloud at age 118, together with his disciples and second generation disciples. That's Master Hai Deng right there. Okay, there's another one. Uh, let's see here. Okay, that's with Master Empty Cloud. All right, now, why am I showing this? I thought someone whose story embodies uh, a lot of those qualities are here, is here. Um, I first met Master Hai Deng uh, here. At the front gate, actually, we went to the airport. The front gate of City of 10,000 Buddhas. Here is Master Hai Deng. Here is our teacher, Shifu Shangren. Uh, the, it says, Welcome the uh, Chinese, uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, martial arts, noble monk. Master Hai Deng, the elder monk, and the 
delegation from the Central Cinema Bureau of China that had come with him. This is uh, this layman here in the turtleneck is Fan Yinglian, who was Master Haidung's uh, chosen uh, Dharma disciple, a uh, martial arts disciple. This is the film, oh, there we go. Zhong Yang Dian Ying Zhi Pian Gong Chang Dai Biao Li Ling, the representatives of the Central Cinema Bureau of China. 1985 is the year. You can see this is the main gate at City of 10,000 Buddhas. Uh, and this is the film director, famous director, who made a film. Master Haidung was uh, a monk. He was born in, in 1902. And uh, he was famous because he had, as a monk, rebuilt Shaolin Monastery's martial arts. Here he is. You can see... This is Shaolin Si. This is Master Haidung. You see how short he was? He was a short in stature, but big in Kung Fu. And he uh, was champion in 50 successive martial arts conquests, uh, martial arts competitions in China. Um, he among his early teachers um, were monks who taught him martial arts. And he learned Tong Gong, the virgin youth style, and uh, Mei Hua uh, Gong, the, the plum flower style. And his most famous claim to fame is this. the one finger stand. Here he is. You can see one finger. That, and he's leaning on the wall, mind you, but all of his body's weight is on that one finger. And he could do this. Now, when he visited CTDB and Gold Mountain Monastery, we saw him do, he was then at that point 80. We saw him do a two finger stand. This is Master Haidang doing a two finger stand. Now, this is at age 679. We saw him, uh, I think, a year earlier. How many of you, how many of us can do a headstand <laughs> or a handstand? or a one hand stand, then remove three more fingers and you've got master high Go, what, how is this possible? Yes, indeed. This is our monk. And master high dung was a sutra explaining, a sutra lecturing bhikshu. He, master Hua invited him to lecture on the Deng Yanjing when he came to the US. Now, the reason I, Master Haidung came to mind was because photographs emerged this week from our Dharma brothers, uh, Alan Nicholson and others who found in a drawer these old negatives. Who is this? This is former monk Hung Chao, Professor Marty Verhoeven, getting personal instruction from Master Haidung in the kitchen of Gold Mountain Monastery. Here he is. Now, Marty is doing Shaolin basic exercises here, right? And he's doesn't look, he's crouching down, his, his knees are at 90 degrees, right? And what you don't know is he was told by Master Haidung to hold that for 10 minutes. <laughs> ah, your, your legs just shout. This is night, this is night, January 1986, says here, January 11th. Okay, well, here's mine. Master Haidung had me hold that pose for 10 minutes. And you can see by the color of my face that I was uh, huffing and puffing. So there he is in Gold Mountain. Haidung La Bashi. What an amazing monk. 
Indeed, indeed. And the fact that he came to uh, California at the invitation of Master Shrenhua to investigate circumstances and to, to share the film. We saw him uh, in terms of, let's, let's pin down some of those qualities that we looked at at the sutra and see if they fit. Um, Master Haidung, we met his airplane in San Francisco. And when he got off the plane, uh, we went to the baggage and he didn't have any. There was no suitcase. What he did have was a green uh, airlines called a flight bag. You remember back in the 60s and 50s, 60s, when you took an international flight, the airlines gave you a uh, plasticized bag with a zipper, right? You could put your shoes in it and a coat. It was a, and it had a strap. It's called an airlines bag and they passed them out. And Master Haidung had that, an old one. And in his bag, he, he opened it up to look for his passport. In his bag, he had a toothbrush and a sweatshirt. That's all. That's all he had. No luggage. He didn't want anything else. He didn't want anything. So some lay people said, oh, we're going to deserve. We need to, you don't have a suitcase. Oh, get him a suitcase. So they went running into San Francisco, bought him a suitcase and gave it to him in the first you know, evening of his arrival. And he and passed it over to the monks at Gold Mountain. He said, you don't want to get stuff. Anything that you have is a burden. And if you don't have virtue, it, you'll pay it back in fur and horns in the future. So we're like, you mean we shouldn't accept offerings? You know, we went right to Shurvo. Shurvo, Shurvo, Master Hai Dung didn't accept anything. And uh, one of the other lay women uh, saw Master Hai Dung didn't have a watch. He didn't have a wristwatch. So she ran out. She came back. She said, La Fasher in America, you need to know what time it is. Here's a watch. She gave him a wristwatch. And he looked at it and Amid and took the wristwatch and looked for one of the young monks, handed it to him for you. He says, I don't want stuff. I don't want stuff. I don't want to pay it back in the future. We said, sure, well, sure, well, Master Hai Dung's not accepting anything. And Master Hua said, uh, you have to understand, you can't match his cultivation. You shouldn't even try. Don't worry about that. He said, in his life, he is cultivating an ascetic path that is his own. He doesn't want those kind of affinities. He said, however, he said, what am I teaching you? He said, do you see me greedy for offerings? Do you see me clinging to things and hanging on to things? He said, you have to learn to become Fu Tian Sung, fields of blessings. If you don't let lay people give you things, and if you don't accept anything, how are they ever going to have blessings? How is the Sangha going to be established? He said, just don't crave offerings and don't be greedy for things, and you'll be fine. You can be a field of blessings. Don't try to imitate Master Hai Dung. He is Buka Sui. His state is inconceivable. So, okay, sure. So then what happened next? Master Hua, uh, so we discovered that Master Hai Dung was radically not greedy. He was so greedy, he wouldn't accept anything. Wow, how about that? And he traveled with a toothbrush and a sweatshirt across the world. So, okay, then what? So you have to have really stopped your outflows before you can live without needing anything, not even a teacup, right? So then what? Then Master Hua invited Master Haidang to explain the Shirangama Sutra. He said, he said, wouldn't you like to establish Dharma affinities with the people on this, this continent, Master Hai Dung? If you explain the Lung Yanjing, we will help you translate. So Lao Bajra said yes. So he only had a few days, but Shifu set him up at Gold Mountain and then at a hall in Chinatown. People came. 
And what did, so we, we came down and when we got to the, the opening, we requested Dharma, we looked over to the right, here was Master Hua kneeling in front of the monk's side of the seats, kneeling to listen to the Dharma. Master Haidung said, Shrifu said, Shrifu knelt to listen to the Dharma. We came up, somebody, I forget who it was, somebody said, Tell Shrifu, you'll knelt, kneel for him. So we did. That was a great idea. Oh, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. Shrifu, Shrifu, woman, teeny, great, neat. Shrifu, neat, neo, shirjing, woman, woman, great, teeny. So we know Shrivel got up smiling and walked around taking care of things. But we were kneeling, listening, then here's our teacher. What a model. He cares about the Dharma so much that he's willing to kneel while another monk listens, lectures. That's the kind of example you don't get. All right. So that night, Master Haidung stayed at Gold Mountain. And uh, I, was, I was a student and I was studying. And I came in late, I was down in the dining hall and I heard somebody walking around, it was about 10 o'clock after the, everything was done, everybody was sleeping and I was going down to, uh, to finish some studies. And here was oh, oh, Master Haidung walking, walking in the dining room. And I thought, oh, here's my chance, here's my chance. And, and I walked up and I, I bowed to Master Haidung and I was thinking, what can I say? Can I say something? Can I ask for something? Ask a question? And he was, he turned slowly and he looked at me and he opened his eyes just like that. And I had the impression that I was seeing flames in his eyes. You think, uh oh, <laughs> you should have been sleeping. You're hallucinating. No, there was so much crackling energy when he opened his eyes to look at me like this he wasn't wearing glasses of course but he opened his eyes and there was this presence in master haidung's eyes some sort of energy there so the next day i said shrifu shrifu last night i ran into master haidung downstairs what happened i said shrifu he he opened his eyes looked like there was fire behind his eyes shrifu said he said, of course, he's full. He never had a girlfriend. Don't you understand? Sort of cheerful. So Master Haidung, that practice that he had of Tongzibong, a virgin boy, virgin youth, martial arts, came because he genuinely had stayed away from any kind of romantic encounter his whole life. So for him, being a monk was the option. Although, and this is, this is a telling point, uh, Master Haidung's uh, motive to cultivate, to leave home originally, which led him to Master Empty Cloud and led him to Shaolin Monastery, you know, was because his father, when Master Haidung was still a boy, his father was uh, trapped and killed by marauding bandits in Sichuan province. And Master Haidung vowed as a young boy that he was going to leave home and learn martial arts and get revenge on the people who had killed his father. That was his goal to cultivate originally, to become tough and able to, to use martial arts to get revenge, uh, Buddhist martial arts. And later his heart opened to compassion and to wisdom, but that was his original motive. Master Hua said, see, he said, he is, cultivating the path of the Vajra, the Jingang, and not the path of the Bodhisattva. They begin in the same place and they travel along, but one 
is there to protect the Dharma from Wu, and the other is to protect the Dharma from Bait. So from compassion. So he said, we were walking parallel paths, but they're different. And sure enough, Master uh, Haidung advised, he said, every left home person should practice the Meng Shan Shi Shi, the Hui Ji Jin Gang, the dirty traces Vajra Dharma and the Meng Shan ceremony, make offerings every day. And he taught, he was going to teach us how to do it. And Shi Hu said, you can teach, teach the bhikshunis, they're going to carry this forward. So from that time on, that was when we started doing the Mangshan giving of offerings every night at Gold Mountain in the city of 10,000 Buddhas. So those are, you know, to have someone who met tragedy as a young boy and turned to the Dharma as a response and then carried it forward so that uh, the undisputed king of martial arts able to do a single finger stand, a two finger stand. There are on YouTube, there are videos of Master Hai Dung where he's got a punching bag and he makes these martial moves. He takes his fingers and he goes, punches right through the punching bag and the sand pours out. He's, this man was unbeatable. He had a skill called Pai Da Gong where you couldn't knock him down. Uh, we followed him to a theater in Chinatown, a movie theater. They played his Shaolin Haidung movie that was made in China. And the one, one showing and the director was there, Master Haidung was there. And after the film, where the place was full, after the film, Master Haidung got on stage and we had to translate for him. And he said, anybody who'd like to come up, if you can knock me over, uh, he said, I'll teach you Shaolin, teach you martial arts. Try it. Anybody, any comers, anybody. Just don't hit my head. He said, hit me anywhere else. And so we had a, a Marine got up and a fireman, these huge guys. And together they rushed him and tried to knock him over. Master Haidung bounced off. Oh, he said, oh, come on, try harder. Oh, classic martial arts demonstration. They pushed him, they knocked him. He just, with his Pai Da Gong, it's like, can't knock me down. Like a roly poly, you know, with a weight in the bottom. They would knock him. He just oh, stepped back. And he, later we asked him, he said, I'm, I just bring my chi to wherever I'm hit in my body. I can move my chi around. And it's just like a pillow. I never get hurt. So how do you beat somebody who you can never knock down in martial arts? That's why he won. Pai Da Gong. That skill. Remarkable monk. So if we, this is the last thing I want to say. It's time to end today. Uh, we learn about the Chinese Mahayana, which blends the wisdom of, of Indian, the insight of prajna with the compassion, connecting through one's own best qualities of virtue, then we have the Bodhisattva path. And it just really appeals to me. And I think the West, America in particular, I know Australia too, Russia too, can learn these qualities of masculinity, what it means to be a, a real man not a tough macho bloke, but instead someone who is kind and strong and wise. That's what we need. That'll carry us through the crisis, the pandemic, onto the bright light on the other side. Hallelujah. Bodhisattva. Okay, uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei Shi, who is there? Anybody there to uh, tell us about the Berkeley Monastery? Go to the website. Oh, okay. That's Jin Chuan Shur. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. I heard uh, Marty when he lectured this uh, Friday. Um, we showed him the picture that you just showed of him doing that that stance. Yeah. Uh, what do you say? Did he tell me? He said, "Yeah." He says his legs were so um, wobbly he could barely make it up the stairs. And he's going up the stairs, and I don't walk by him and said, "College kid." <laughs> I know. Yeah. It, so Marty was wobbling up the stairs after that workout yeah. and Master Haidung ran past him at full speed and over his shoulder said, college kid, he said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Right. Lecture again. So uh, yesterday was his first lecture. His okay. uh, Friday evening, 730 to 9. Um, in addition to that, 
our other main announcement is Jing Weishu and myself were uh, asked to also help with another online retreat with the four, we call it the four fearless hearts, but these are known to us often as the four boundless hearts or the si, mm -hmm. kindness, mm -hmm. compassion, joy, and equanimity. And this is hosted with Service Space. So it's March 26th to April 2nd, 2022. So if you have the time, you can put that in your calendar. It's a kind of a self-paced retreat. So um, if you just want to spot two or three hours a day and you can have the retreat at home. Um, other than that, our regular schedule is the same, daily schedule. Um, we have our Great Compassion Mantra, Dedication of Merit at the end of the month and all our classes. So for instance, Saturday night with Verhung Shur, also Friday afternoons with Verhung Shur and um, Steve and Tanner is lecturing on Wednesday. So that's pretty much our, our schedule. That's pretty much it. Good. We're back after the winter break, um, the winter retreats. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that report. Um, we will now transfer the merit of today's lecture, dedicate the merit. However, you would like to do so. Um, we do it with a tune that accompanies Sanskrit version of Medicine Buddha's mantra, the mantra for anointing the crown of the head. We recite it three times and learn it. So as we're in traffic, in a car, in a vehicle, as we're, you know, can't sleep, wondering at night how to get to sleep, uh, as we're feeling tired during the day and need a boost, all these different times of the day, it's perfect time to recite Medicine Buddha's mantra. And the more we recite it, the, especially with the tune, it kind of, it complements the heartbeat. And we find that somehow I'm feeling in sync with the world and things are balanced. They're right, they're in harmony. Uh, as this, as the, the virus has removed us from, har from balance and harmony, uh, the mantra has the power with the ripples that it sends out to, to rebalance and to reharmonize and to purify. So let's, let's try, see if you can, people learned it by now. We're gonna keep going till the, the plague is done. And we'll go back to our dedication of merit. But meanwhile, we'll use this one, here we go. We 
have one more thing to do before we end, which is to bow to the Buddhas. You're welcome to join if you care to. I'll ring the bell and make three half bows. Here we go. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. All right, that'll do it for us for today. See you all next week. Stay healthy. Omitofo.